Hello, I am Dave Ortega and I'm at Somerville Media Center. Uh, and I'm happy to be joined with Julia Taliesin for another SMC Somerville Journal News Roundup. Hello, Julia. Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right now that I'm back in the hot set. <laughs> I'm jealous. I wish I could be with you. I know. I wish you were here too. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're aiming for that. Julia, why don't you start us off as we have been with um, some, some COVID data with the, awesome. uh, pertaining to the city. Awesome, yes. Um, so the city continues to do a really great job of um, kind of updating this. Um, it's no longer updated every day, which is fine. They were really in it for a while. <laughs> I think it's updated twice a week. Um, so the most recent da data we have um, is from the 18th, um, so Tuesday the 18th of August. Um, so, so far, um, cases have been kind of plateauing. We haven't had any new um, fatalities in several weeks, which is great. Um, so far, we have a total confirmed positive of um, 1,069 people, um, probable positives of 92. So those are people who have been tested but haven't necessarily gotten their results back yet. Um, over 1,000, so 1,064 have recovered. Um, and there have been 37 fatalities so far. And that's the number. Um, of course, that's awful. Um, but in a, you know, small silver lining is that that hasn't increased in a few weeks, which is really great. So hopefully, you know, people are getting the care that they need. Um, people aren't dying um, of this virus the same way that they were um, earlier in this. Um, so that's kind of where we are Somerville wise. Um, but I actually did want to mention that the state has just released this really cool new interactive um, data map. Um, you can find it on the Mass.gov website. Um, it's community level COVID-19 data reporting and it's like average daily case rate per 100,000. Um, you can look at it kind of um, town by town, city by city. Yep, if you zoom in, you can find like Somerville, Medford. Um, and kind of if you check out the um, case numbers, you'll see exactly, thank you, Dave. Um, red is like bad, obviously. Yellow is a little bit um, like moderate, green is low, and then white is almost non-existent. Um, so Somerville, as we have been for a while, has is doing pretty well again. Um, with everything that's going on. So you'll see that um, you can see the kind of total case rate, the two-week case count, um, which is pretty low uh, for a city of 80,000 when you think about it. Um, but what I thought was really cool is the total number of tests that have been administered. So this is 30,218 tests have been administered in Somerville. And just in the last 14 days, 5,000 tests, which is pretty interesting. It means that people are going out, they are getting tested, they are being careful about this stuff, which is really cool to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so we we kind of just, I just looked at this today. Um, I was going to post, I just posted something actually. Um, but this is something to keep your eye on. This is a really great tool as well as using the city data. Um, you can also kind of just like take a look at everything that's going on in here. Yeah. So you can look at like our closest neighbor, right? So Everett and Chelsea, which ha is consistent with kind of how things have been going, are still having higher case counts. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is a great tool, and especially like like you mentioned the um, the number of tests mm -hmm. because that that's something that's on a lot of people's mind is, mm -hmm. is minds. You know, is uh, you know what is the number uh, of tests that we're seeing on a mm -hmm. weekly basis, and and are are we keeping up with that? You know, is mm -hmm. that is that the test number that we need in order to get an accurate count because exactly nationally uh the perception is that the the count is low because because of uh the the test the number of tests is is thought to be perceived of as low so actually having a number associated with that is really um interesting yes and actually if you'll scroll down on the somerville you can see that they have so the total tests in the last 14 days and then the positive tests in the last 14 days. So that, that is a big difference, right? So over 5,000 tests and 47 positive. So that is just kind of when you're think when we think about like how to contain this virus, like the amount of testing it takes, that, that right there is a really good number to keep in mind mm -hmm. that like it takes broad testing to find those cases and then contain those cases. You know what I mean? So I just think that's a really interesting um, thing to keep in mind. Yeah. So yeah. I really enjoyed this tool. I'm definitely going to be keeping my eye on it. Um, moving on to elections. We have the primary yeah. coming up on September 1st, uh, but there's some deadlines ahead of uh, September 1st to look out for. Why don't we, why don't you uh, talk about those? Sure. Of course. So I just, I'm trying to like push this as much as I can. So 
if you are still need to register to vote or if you need to change your address, which is something important to keep in mind, Mind, um, you want to register to vote or change your address by Saturday, August 22nd, which is coming up real fast. Um, this is just for the September 1st primary. Um, and if you need to register, if you're just registering to vote for the November election, you have until October 24th to register or change your address for that election. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. And then if you are choosing to do a mail-in ballot, um, applications need to be returned by August 26th, which is a Wednesday. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind um, for that September 1st primary. And if you're a summer resident, there are several contested elections. Um, so definitely go online. You can go online um, to Somerville website and find a sample ballot um, already. Those are up um, to see like who, you know, if you're curious, we have a ton of information up online. Um, we have a whole topics page, um, somerville.wickedlocal.com slash topics slash September primary. Um, and you can find letters, um, profiles we've done on candidates, questionnaires, um, and all the information you need to kind of figure out like who you're voting for and who you want to vote for. <laughs> um, but just kind of like logistic information. So if you're voting by mail, you have to get that application in by the 26th. Um, and then you obviously, once you get it, you should send that in as soon as possible. However, I wanted to mention that um, there's been a lot of information going around about kind of concern with the United States Postal Service. Yeah. Um, so if you, for any reason, are concerned about your ballot, um, there is an option to hand deliver your ballot. So you don't have to go and vote in person at a polling station. You can, you will be mailed your ballot, you can fill it out, and then you can drop it off into a mailbox outside City Hall on School Street in Somerville. So it's like a black mailbox. Um, I know there's a sign on it. Um, they might be working on even better signage um, to make sure that people know that's where they can drop their mail-in ballots. Um, but several city councilors have posted about this. The city has said that this is available. Um, so if you want a mail-in ballot, but you want to make sure it gets there and you really want to see it through <laughs> to the end, you can drop it in with your very own hands to this mailbox outside City Hall. And yeah. the election department is in City Hall. Oh, uh, what was that last part? Sorry. It's okay. The elections department is in city hall. So they are right there and they will be able to get your ballot. Very important information. And uh, I've been following um, the city's Twitter account mm -hmm. and they actually had like a six part tweet uh, about with all this information on it, yes. the, the deadline for uh, uh, ballot applications mm -hmm. um, as well as letting people know about the drop off box on the school street entrance uh, just outside of city hall. So yes. if, uh, if you want more information, you can definitely go to the Somerville Journal website, but you could also go to uh, the city's website. Um, and, and their Twitter. Yeah. Absolutely. We retweeted that. Yeah, that was a great thread. Yeah. Yes. And I find, I found uh, personally that the city's social media is, has more concise uh information than the elect the elections page on their website, which can be a little um, kind of difficult maybe for the average person to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, so go to, if you have any questions, go to the city's uh, social media and uh, you'll find some concise information there. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, um, any, so, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 just a couple more things. Um, there's there's um, voting, if you do want to vote in person, you can find your precinct if you're not sure where it is. Um, it's important to know that the city council voted to change five polling stations due to COVID safety concerns. Um, so the polling places for um, uh, precincts one and three in Ward 3, um, precincts one and three in Ward 6, and precinct three in Ward 7 have all been changed. Um, so you can go to somervillema.gov slash COVID-19 polling changes to, um, to find that, or just somervillema.gov slash my Somerville. Um, to find your precinct. Um, so just make sure you know where to go. <laughs> um, where to go. So all of that information, if, if you're in one of those precincts, check yeah. it out. Um, and also the other thing is early voting is available. So early voting is available at City Hall, August 22nd through 28th, but hours do vary by day. Um, so check out summerlma.gov slash 2020 elections updates. Um, for that information. Um, so we've compiled a whole list with all these links, but if you go on Somerville's website, they will have a lot of information. Yeah. Um, I, I think this year, like it's, it's important to maybe have a plan, um, which wasn't always the case uh, yeah. ahead of any election uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, it's definitely in, in mine. 
and I'm sure in yours. Uh, so yeah, you may just need to plan ahead this uh, election day. Um, if, you, if you're mailing your ballot in, make sure you mail it in as soon as you can. If you're dropping it off, you know, go to City Hall and drop it off. Just just have a plan. Great advice. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh -huh. Um, yes. And then just to touch on those contested races, um, like I mentioned, we have candidate guides. If you don't even know who your legislator is or what, what, you know, what's going on, um, you should go to malegislature.gov slash search slash find my legislator. And you will be able to find who you are currently represented by um, and what district you're in and what's going on um, so that you know kind of what's going on and who, if there's a contested race, et cetera. Um, and like I said, if you go to somervillema.gov slash sample ballots, you'll be able to find a sample ballot with that information on it. Um, so lots of ways to find this. Um, but if you are in the 27th Middlesex, there is a contested race for state representative between Katya Sharp and Erica Eiderhoven. If you are in the 34th Middlesex district, there is a contested race for state rep between um, incumbent Christine Barber and new candidate Anna Callahan. Um, and then if you are in the 2nd Middlesex district, which is um, the senator district, there's also a contested race between incumbent Pat Jalen um, and new candidate Gary Fisher. Um, so that I know that one applies to me. I live in the second middle sex, so I've had to do a little bit of research on that. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind um, that a lot, and these are all Democratic primaries. Um, so just keep your eye on that. Um, and yeah, stay informed, people. Stay informed. And part of that staying informed, you know, SMC has... Uh, done a profile candidate series for every election cycle, and this election cycle is no different. So uh, those uh, candidate profiles are up on Somerville Community Access TV at various times. Um, so you can check the schedule to find out when it's playing. You could also go to our video on demand on our website, somervillemedia.org. You could also go to our YouTube page and find them there. So any number of ways to get information about um, these these people that are appearing, that may appear on your ballot uh, here in Somerville. So good election information. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Thank you. Another, another uh, burning topic throughout the city <laughs> is the opening, the reopening of the Tufts campus to uh, students physically uh, reappearing on, on campus and, and attending classes in person. Uh, which is, I think it's fair to say it's controversial. Um, we've, yes. you, attended a, you attended a protest recently. Uh, what happened at that protest? I did. Um, so on August 19th, on Wednesday morning, there was a, a protest outside of Tufts President Anthony Monaco's home um, on the Tufts campus in Medford. Um, so it was a, a socially distant protest, um, which was interesting, but um, it was interesting because uh, the president's home is right across from the tennis courts, which is where they've set up all, all of the new modular uh, housing units, which is where Tufts has said that they will house students who need to be quarantined. Um, so it was quite a striking setting. Um, but there, there is a lot going on with this. Um, Tufts released their initial plan at the end of June. So this has been kind of going on, this conversation has been going on for a while. Um, and residents were a little concerned. Several who have talked to me have said that um, they were upset that when Tufts posted their plan, it was the first that they'd heard of it, that Tufts never kind of went to them and tried to engage them in any way and ask them what they thought, or um, there was no kind of community kind of discussion before the plan was released. Um, since then, there, have, there has been some. Um, Tufts held a community meeting on August 4th, um, which I think they took questions beforehand. And then um, there was some presentation um, by Tufts president, Anthony Monaco, and some, um, of, some of Tufts staff answered those questions. Um, but at, uh, the city council actually at the public's request held a public hearing on this issue um, that following day on August 5th. Um, and at that public hearing, a lot of residents expressed that it, it didn't feel like a community meeting, that Mm. Um, though Tufts did answer some questions that they got to kind of pick and choose which questions they had to answer, that it wasn't necessarily live um, with like public giving feedback and Tufts having to respond on the spot. Um, and that they, they felt um, some residents called it disrespectful, um, that this that this is kind of how Tufts was going about it. Um, and of course, this is this is a nuanced issue. Um, these universities are dealing with impossible situations you know what I mean it's, it's not it's not easy it's not black and white um 
But I think especially in the last week or two, as universities around the country have started to reopen, um, some who have reopened in person have already closed or gone right. to remote instruction um, after outbreaks have occurred. And yesterday, sorry, the 19th, um, which we're recording on the 20th, so on the 19th, um, that was kind of one of the things that were spoken about by the residents at this protest is like, what's going to happen? You know what I mean? Is, are we just going to wait until there's an outbreak and then close everything down two weeks later? Like, isn't there a better way to go about this? Um, and Tufts, um, so it, it's important to note, so the, the, this protest was organized primarily by members of Our Revolution, Medford and Somerville. Um, there were a number of community members there um, and they had put together a list of 10 demands for Tufts. Um, so these demands cover kind of a number of areas um, from housing. So they, they want a clear plan to de-densify campus, which for them is single op occupancy rooms only, um, any group residences following state guidelines and quarantine facilities that do not share restrooms. They want free PPE and testing to all workers and contract workers. They want free testing to members of the Medford and Somerville community, lecture classes to be held remotely, um, publicizing cleaning protocols and public health metrics that will um, like when to implement closure. There's, you know, there's a number of requests um, and Tufts has responded to some of them. They've said that, that they have a clear, cl plan to de-densify campus. It isn't single occupancy rooms only. They've said that um, graduate um, programs are online um, and that they are kind of trying to, you know, limit um, cohorts and have like a specific plan for people only like living with those, you know, um, like six people cohorts who don't kind of go outside, who share a restroom, who share that, and that's it. Um, they are offering a free PPE and testing to all workers, including contract workers. Um, and according to Tufts, they are kind of in conversation with Medford and Somerville officials about offering testing to the community. Um, so I think, you know, from Tufts perspective, like they are meeting some of these demands. Um, but I know that a lot of these community members are not, they're not happy and they're not content with kind of where yeah. things are at. Um, and I think, a big, a big kind of theme that I heard yesterday was about um, workers, is about um, what's going to happen when workers get sick. Um, you know, is Tufts, are they being offered hazard pay? Are they being offered, um, you know, paid time off? Like what's going on? And um, I don't want to say, I don't know exactly what Tufts is or is not doing. I haven't been able to get a clear response um, from any of the unions. There hasn't been much information shared about that at this point. Um, so that's something I'm kind of still looking at, um, but that was a big concern that was shared. Um, but, you know, what, one thing to consider is like, so BU has already had an outbreak. Emerson has already reported cases. Um, and Tufts', Tufts his plan brings all students back to campus, pretty much all undergraduate students back to campus. Um, so I think a lot of communities uh, or a lot of residents are just really concerned about the impact this is going to have. Um, right. So and it, outbreaks, outbreaks on those campuses, because I know BU and Emerson offered uh, hybrid options for to the students. Um, were, was a hybrid offer, uh, excuse me, was a hybrid um, option offered to Tufts students as well? So Tufts's plan is a hybrid plan. Um, they are offering, I believe, some classes um, remotely and some in person. Um, I think it, it's complicated. It, it differs by school. Mm -hmm. um, like within Tufts University, right? Like the different schools of um, subject, you know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's, it's not kind of one overarching. Um, so students could have some classes remotely and some classes in person. Um, and they have um, shared some photographs of like socially distant classrooms that they've prepared. Um, and I know that um, certainly like lab, lab classes are going to be held in person. Um, which, you know, actually is referenced in the uh, demands from these residents. They just, their request for lab classes is that they follow state guidelines for socially distancing, PPE and cleaning. Um, and one resident um, at the protest made a comment that um, the goal is like not to make these students feel unwelcome, not to adversely impact the education of these students in any way, um, but to just protect the public health of Somerville and Medford communities, um, to acknowledge that these students um, live in Somerville Medford housing, that they're not all on campus, that they're really spread throughout the city um, and that they are, you know, visiting our businesses, which is a good thing, but also, you know, 
and at the same time interacting with residents and that um, it's Tufts' responsibility to ensure that they are not presenting a risk. Um, Tufts has prepared or um, presented a, ra a rather robust testing plan. Um, I think it's, it's two to three times a week for students hmm. um, and at least once a week or one to two times a week for faculty and staff, depending on how student facing they are. Um, but I think what some people have said is that the, the testing will be self-administered by students. So they'll, they'll be trained once and then they will administer their own tests. Um, and it's a different kind of test. I believe it's a front of nose test. I don't know. Um, have you had a COVID test, Dave? I have. Okay. I had the pleasure. <laughs> the pleasure, indeed. So I have as well. And mine was kind of what we call the, the brain tickle, right? <laughs> Yeah. Like really, really up there, right in your nose. Mm -hmm. um, but these are a little different. I believe it's front of nose testing, so it's more a sample taken from a lower part of the nose, um, which is a little bit less uncomfortable. But it also, I think, can be less reliable. Mm -hmm. um, but the testing is being conducted by the Broad Institute. They're saying that they can turn around tests in 24 hours. That it is reliable. Um, but community members are just concerned. So I think they just have a lot of questions. They're like, what if, what if this doesn't work? What if one thing goes wrong? What if they can't turn around testing in 24 hours? What if a sample comes back and it wasn't a good enough sample? So the test wasn't valid. Like what, what happens? You know what I mean? When all of these things just break down a little bit. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's the 20th of August. Students are coming back. This is happening. Um, it's happening now. So um, I think, you know, I don't know what's going to change in the next couple of weeks. I'm not entirely sure how Tufts will or will not shift or how residents' perspectives will shift. Um, but we're kind of in it at this point. Um, so it's going to be a matter of kind of just seeing what happens. Interesting. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> uh, for sure. And I know we were joking about the, 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 um, the testing there. But um, I, I will just say definitely don't let the, any sort of uh, oh, discomfort no. or or any sort of fear about that uh, uh, inhibit you from, from getting no, tested. And that's all it is. It's just uncomfortable. Yeah, it's, it's just not, It's not painful, it's just uncomfortable. We can take it. I have, a I have another test scheduled for Monday and I'm happy to do it, so. <laughs> exactly, <there you> <laughs> right? It's It'll better be than third. the alternative. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, so moving on to uh, the Winter Hill Urban Renewal Plan, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, sure. Yeah. So this is kind of um, I don't have a story out quite yet about this. I was ho hoping to post something uh, today or tomorrow. Um, so the Winter Hill Ur Urban Renewal Plan was shared uh, a few weeks ago. Um, but the reason why I want to bring this up is because this is about that star market, which everyone wants to know about <laughs> that kind but of everybody's empty, been talking about this star market. Since yes, empty star market on Broadway, which has yeah. just like been vacant for so long. Um, and residents are like, yo, like what is going to happen with this site? Um, so I don't I don't have necessarily a ton of information to share. I watched the Summer Re Redevelopment Th Authority meeting Um they kind of received the plan. Um, there's a lot more process to go. So kind of where we're at now, um, the plan was released to the public. They're still asking for feedback from the public. Um, the SRA now has it. They're going to be reviewing it and asking for kind of like changes and updates from the city. Um, then it goes to the planning board for kind of zoning compliance and all of that. Then it goes to the city council for a public hearing um, and more comment from the city council, at which point it may be kicked back to the SRA for kind of final edits before it's kind of like settled on and it kind of moves a little bit outward into that like community process that's going to happen um, because there's so there's so much so there's there's a lot there's a lot to do with the site they've kind of broken it down into three parcels from what I understand um, there's that big parcel which is includes the star market um, which they have planned like a more kind of commercial and residential um, development with some kind of green and open space um, there's another parcel um, which they uh, want to put a public park on, um, hopefully owned by the city. Um, and then another parcel, which they want to build affordable housing on. So that's kind of like the basis of it. Um, but there's, of course, nuance to this plan. And what really I heard at the SRA meeting is that like, this is the vision and they've already held community meetings, some of which I've attended in the past year on like what the city, what the public wants to see with this area. Um, but they said that like, this is like what we've heard so far, but it's by no means like the end of the process that like, mm -hmm. this is what we've heard. This is what we think would be good. Um, 
but like, there's still so much to work out. You know, there's developers to talk to, then there's the project proposals. Um, there's going to be negotiations about affordable housing and different community benefits. Like this is a long process. And that is one thing that was discussed a little bit is that the reason why they decided to kind of break it up is because they would like to build that public park like sooner rather than later. They don't necessarily want to wait like five years to like get a developer, get the project proposal, do the whole community process and get that whole big parcel built before they have like a nice community park, you know what I mean, for the neighborhood. So because I, often I, often when that happens, I think you, you have a public park that's shoved into a development or exactly, or um, exactly. So that's what designing around about. a park sounds really uh, forward thinking in that regard. Right, exactly. Um, yes, and several actually did reference kind of using the union square process as like a learning experience for this to like make sure that at least some of these community benefits don't get tied up in that bigger development that like the community already gets this and then they might just get some more you mean mm -hmm. from from this other bigger development. Um, so there's there's going to be a lot more on this. Um, but I wanted to kind of write something up because they're still accepting public comment. I wanted to kind of do a little bit about this, get some info out there so people know that like now is the time that they can like start thinking about what do I want? And, you know, how long is this going to take? And um, you, you can submit your public comment to the city and the SRA. Yeah. The city, uh, city councilor Ben Ewan Campen uh, posted on social media about this. And uh, he also noted that the term urban renewal is, is kind of a loaded term, which I appreciate it. Yes. Um, he's always really like conscious of that, of that, of that stuff, which is important as, as uh, somebody in, uh, as a public servant. Uh, and I appreciate that, that, uh, you know, ur urban renewal is uh, a term often associated with um, driving out certain segments of the existing population, which tend to be, um, you know, uh, working class or, or poor um, or of color. Um, so, you know, he, he made note of, of the use of that term. Um, so good on you, Ben, you and Campen. <laughs> oh, yeah, and he, he is actually serving as a member of the Somerville Redevel Redevelopment Authority. So he is on that body and obviously on the city council. So he's all over it. <laughs> nice. Uh, and as we wrap up, what, what do you want to leave us with? Um, I wanted to kind of uh, mention that um, kind of as we're heading into the fall, I, I'm really interested to kind of hear from the community about how school is going, how students are doing. Um, I, I really love hearing from parents um, about kind of just the different experiences and perspectives that they have to share on this because it is different for everyone. Um, but at the same time, many, many parents share, you know, some struggles that this time presents. Um, and also, um, we've been looking at dining a little bit, um, with all of this new outdoor dining that's come to our city, you know, you can't help but thinking as a New England resident, what's going to happen when it gets cold, mm -hmm. because it will. Um, so I, I definitely, um, would love to hear from restaurant owners or managers about what are they thinking? What are they planning? Are they buying heat lamps? Um, how, how are they advocating for themselves to kind of, as we head into this New England winter, um, and kind of how is how is this going to impact restaurants in the city? So those are two things I have my eye on, as well as a gajillion other things. As always, you can reach out to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, I think that's all I got for you. Awesome. Uh, well, as always, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, sit here for a half hour and, and hash out these things with you, Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, for more information, go to the Somerville Journal website, which is somervillejournal.com. Sure. It's also somerville.wickedlocal.com. It's both. It's both. So somerville.wickedlocal.com or somervillejournal.com. Um, if you want to find out more about Somerville Media programming, go to somervillemedia.org. Uh, I'm Dave Ortega for Somerville Media Center and uh, stay safe out there, everybody.